Hi everyone, hope you're well today. Looking forward to our chanting, meditations and Dharma talk, continuing the commentary on the contemplation of the law of karma or cause and effect. I'll start today's class by wishing my mother a happy 86th birthday today. I think this may be the first time we've done the online Dharma classes, but it's been your birthday. So now I can wish it to you on the day. And we're going to get some pizza later. We'll actually have it delivered to the house. Um, I looked it up on the internet and I know how to do it now. Normally we, we have home-cooked meals. It's, it's our habit, you know. But um, we got a pizza last year as well, or a couple of pizzas. We have different pizzas. and um, But I went out to get it last year, where today it's going to be delivered after my walk after class, probably around the time that I'm posting the video on Facebook and on YouTube or uploading on YouTube. But yeah, so um, we've had a nice day today. And so mum's just chilling out, relaxing and uh, not doing much apart from enjoyable things. So that's a good thing. All right. So and also maybe I say happy birthday to John. I know that Sos um, watches the video later, Sos being a Dharma student. And um, it's her husband's birthday. I think John maybe, I don't know, just a little bit younger than mum. So anyway, happy birthday to everyone else who's got a birthday today. And remember that every day is your birthday. Every time you breathe in, it's your birthday, <laughs> actually. Then breathe out, end of the birthday, breathe in another birthday. I think you get my, my point. So we do the chanting right now, and um, and then some meditation before we finish up on the contemplation of the law of karma. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa. Udham saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Dutayambi buddham saranam gachami. Dutayambi dhammam saranam gachami. Dutayambi sangham saranam gachami. Tatayambi buddham saranam gachami. Tatayambi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatayambi sangham saranam gachami. Namo buddhaya namo dharmaya namo sangaya. Namo buddhaya namo dharmaya namo sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from the happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment to the near, and aversion from the far. I shall cause this. Great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind, and present clouds of every type of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time, and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until sightless -like existence ends, and turn the wheel of Dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Tayata Hum Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sam Gati Bodhisattva. Tayata ungati gati para gati para sam gati bodhisattva. Tayata ungati gati para gati para sam gati bodhisattva. So now get yourself in a nice comfortable position for meditation practice. 
And initially we will, will release the tension in the body. So nice and relaxed face. Make sure you're not frowning or clenching your jaw. Shoulders nice and relaxed without slouching. And bring your mind inside your body. Starting at the tips of the toes. And release the tension. As I mentioned, these parts of the body and you focus on them. Release the tension from this area. So all around your toes and the bottom of your feet, the balls, the arches, the heels. Top of the feet in between the toe bones, all the ligaments and tendons in there. Around your ankles, Achilles tendons, and your lower legs, calf muscles, shins. All around your knees and upper leg, quad muscles and hamstrings. And around or near your hips and hip flexors, groin, glutes. From your lower back and sides and the stomach. the center of your back and your upper back, rhomboid muscles, lateral muscles, upper trap muscles, your chest and underneath your arms and your shoulders, triceps and biceps. Elbows and forearms, wrists, hands, fingers, thumbs. And now bring your mind to your neck and release whatever tension you may have all around your neck. In the back of your head, sides of your head, around your ears, temples, and all around your face around the cheekbones, and your cheeks, chin, mouth, nose and sinuses, and eye sockets, and eyes, forehead, and the crown of your head. And now briefly scan your body again from the bottom to the top to see if there's any leftover tension that you're able to release. And if there is, do it. Now bring your focus to the tip of your nose initially. <clears throat> and the object of the meditation is the breath or the feeling of the breath as you breathe in your nose, all the way into your lungs, then back out your nose again. Breathing in and breathing out. That's all you have to do physically, mentally. All you have to do is focus on the breath or the feeling of the breath. And then replace your mind onto this breath or feeling of the breath if your mind wanders or becomes dull. That's all you have to do mentally. As you breathe in your nose, the air is quite cool, it passes your throat, and then goes past the bronchial area, then into the lungs, they expand as they fill with the air, and compress as the air leaves the lungs, as you exhale. The air is quite quite warm now as it passes your throat on the way out your nose, breathing in, breathing out. If thoughts arise or mental activity arises, don't cling to it or grasp at it. Don't try to force it away or deny it, but simply and naturally let it go by replacing your mind back onto the breath. And if your mind becomes dull or sleepy, then replace it onto your breath more brightly. You can also add the extra technique of counting the breaths from one up to 10, then back to one again and so on. Don't count past 10, as we don't want the counting to become the focus. We want the focus to remain at the feeling of the breath as you breathe in and out. If you get distracted while counting towards 10, 
go back to one at that time. So let's practice like this in silence for a little bit. <clears throat> Just remind you that, continue to work with your eyes closed now, but just remind you that focusing on the breath tends to bring the mind inside the body. To so breathe in and breathe out. Allows your mind to be free from wandering around outside in the past or in the future and more in the present moment. Also, you can contemplate sometimes the breath is impermanent, like all phenomena, constantly changing. Therefore, it's here free from independent self, so emptiness of self. You can realize this by contemplating the breath. It's not a, it is a physical object and action, but the actual image you could say of the breath in the mind is mental, obviously. Without the mind, we don't experience. And this is likewise, you know, with karma, it's created in the mind. That's why I wanted to mention that now. So even though we say we're focusing on the feeling of the breath, it could be physical feeling or the feeling inside your mind. Um, actually, it's more about focusing on the image of the breath. And then when other mental activities arise, you apply the, the Dharma antidotes, you know, um, replacing the mind on the breath, such as that. And therefore, we're covering what we call the four 
foundations of mindfulness uh, all at the same time. Okay, the, the foundation of form, feeling, mind and mind objects or actions of the mind, if you like, also known as phenomena, mental phenomena, including the Buddhist teachings and applying these antidotes, applying these methods, you know, so just wanted to remind you about that as well. And I thought actually somebody asked me a little while ago whether, because I gave her a talk, only like 15 minute talk or something like that um, for a Buddhist event um, for the Dharmakaya Temple as well, actually for the World Alliance of Buddhists, of which I'm these days an advisor for, and um, it's sort of run by Dharmakaya Temple as well. And so, um, so I gave the talk on mindfulness and the benefits of mindfulness. And I utilized a part of an article I wrote years ago. And um, this sort of like summarizing uh, paragraph. And I thought, because I still had the paper here beside me, just in handwriting. And I thought I'd read it to you while we're doing meditation today, before we switch to the loving kindness meditation. So rather than focusing on your breath now, just focus on my words. And once again, we can utilize maybe at the same time if you want, or you can review the video and write it down yourself. It's also been up there on Facebook as well and out there in the, the world, the media world, social media. And so um, this is it. This is the teaching. So just listen and then absorb your mind as, as you go along with it, really. Genuine mindfulness practice is a way of directing attention and awareness to the present moment, reminding oneself to stay present when the mind wanders, as well as carefully discerning those mental states and behaviours that are helpful from those that are not. It is not merely a way to relax or manage emotions, even though relaxation and the calming of emotions does occur during the process of the practice. Genuine mindfulness practice leads to one-pointed concentration and eventually to the realization of genuine insight into the nature of reality. So you can see the, the Eightfold Path, Three High Trainings again there, and that is morality, foundation, then practicing meditation to develop concentration, utilizing then this concentration to develop wisdom or insight. And mindfulness practice helps us to do that, the genuine mindfulness practice. Like I mentioned, not just about relaxing, even though relaxing happening happens as you practice and um, so on. Okay, Not only about managing emotions, but that happens along the way as you practice and practice correctly. So I, I sort of saw that sitting around the other day and I thought, you know what, I did get asked about that um, a few weeks ago now and um, whether I could actually expand upon it. I didn't want to expand today too much because we have another subject, but I thought I'd sort of slip it in there with our meditations. So now you can feel pleased with yourself for engaging and first of all, releasing the tension, which can, can be sort of coupled with, you could say, Vipassana, penetrative insight. And then developing the concentration by practicing the meditation on the breath. Then learning something about mindfulness. Really be pleased about that. Fill yourself with the universal love and kindness. We'll do this briefly now so that we can finish the other one or the, the rest of the commentary on the law of karma today. So fill yourself with so much love and kindness that it now overflows and radiates outwards initially to your loved ones, family and friends, filling them with the universal love and kindness too. Like I said, we'll keep it really brief today because I expanded a, a little bit on mindfulness then or expounded. And so now you can include strangers, fill them with the universal love and kindness and also include those you find really difficult, may regard as enemies. May all of these three different types of people from your own perspective have happiness, be free from suffering and be peaceful. And also have the same feelings, same wishes, aspirations. And also extending this love and kindness now, 
to all beings around your immediate area. All of the different types of living beings that live on the land, in the air, the waters, born whether from eggs or wombs, the moisture or through transformation. Extend this love and kindness to all of these living beings and slowly and gradually further and further throughout your whole state and county and other states and counties throughout your whole country. and all of the countries throughout the world, as well as throughout all of the oceans, which the oceans actually host vast amount, amounts more living beings than anywhere else, down to the core of the earth and the outermost atmosphere, and beyond this planet, throughout the whole solar system, throughout the whole galaxy, universe and throughout infinite space feel very pleased again with yourself and let's recite the dedication prayer due to this merit may i soon attain the enlightened state of the buddha so that i may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering may the precious body chita not yet born arise and grow may that born have no decline but increase forevermore and may the precious view of shunyata not yet born arise and grow May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay, so let's continue here. We have maybe about 18 minutes or so. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we can, not pretty sure, we're going to finish this today. We have two big paragraphs and one little one summarizing. Okay, so uh, what I'll do first, though, is I'll read you the article once again, and um, right up to where we're going to continue onwards today from. I'll try to do it uh, reasonably brief without rushing too much. The Buddhist belief in the universal law of karma is a view that has been thoroughly checked and analyzed by many great practitioners and realized masters since the time of the Buddha. Conviction in his, its validity is gained through logical reasoning. It should not simply be followed blindly. Karma means action or cause. Any action of body, speech and mind places an imprint, an energy potential or seed in the mind. Mental seeds are planted through your awareness of what you do, say, or think. The imprints of these actions are left on the mind stream and carried on moment by moment with the, mo the present moment of mind coming from the previous moment of mind. When the necessary supporting conditions are in place, this imprint or latent potency manifests as perceptions or experiences of happiness or suffering. We can liken this to a biological seed which ripens when the contributing causes and conditions of water, soil, sun, and the like are gathered together. There are three types of action, virtuous, non-virtuous, and neutral. With virtuous actions, the karma ripens as something desirable, a feeling of pleasure in the short term, and ultimately protects you from suffering. With non-virtuous actions, the karma ripens as something undesirable, a feeling of suffering and pain. With neutral actions, the karma is neither virtuous nor non-virtuous and ripens as something neither desirable nor undesirable. We should thoroughly contemplate well upon the virtuous and non-virtuous actions and their results so that we ourselves can act properly in regards to what to do and what not to do or what to abandon and what to adopt, what to pick up, what to put down. It is said that there are four laws of karma. One, karma is fixed. Virtuous or good actions must cause pleasure. Non-virtuous or harmful actions must cause suffering. Two, karma expands. As with biological seeds, results are vastly greater than the causes. Three, karma not committed cannot produce a result. We cannot expect the results of the benefits of meditation, for example, if we don't create the causes by practicing meditation. Four, karma, when committed, must produce a result. Once created, karma will not simply disappear. It remains in the mind stream and will ripen in due time unless purified. The subtle working of karma and its consequences are deep, deeply hidden phenomena, not knowable to the, the ordinary mind. We need to receive teachings from unmistaken and authentic, learned and highly realized sources to gain genuine understanding into this subject. There are two most basic types of karma. One, movement of the mind, which is mental karma. 
and two, what it motivates, actions of body and speech, or movement of the mind and what it brings. Mental movement is an action of thought. What it causes are actions of body and speech. These are either communicating or not. What causes the worlds? Our actions cause the multitude of worlds. It is the past deeds of living beings that cause all the multitudes of worlds, both the places and the beings they contain. Karma can ripen in this life, next life or subsequent lives. Actions, both positive and negative, which can ripen in the same life are due to the special feature of the object or the thought involved. Such karma, which will definitely ripen, are those involved which involve fierce mental afflictions or fate that are directed towards an object of special qualities, anything done on a continual basis, as well as deeds with results which are something seen due to the features of the object or thought. The four types of deeds that will definitely ripen are one, deeds committed with a strong emotion, positive or negative, that is with fierce emotions, of either mental affliction or faith. Two, deeds committed towards a very holy object, such as the Buddha or one's teachers. Three, deeds committed repeatedly on a continual basis. Four, deeds committed towards objects of special help to you, like your mother and father. This is due to the extraordinary level of assistance they have given you. They have given you a human body, for instance, capable of reaching enlightenment. The two features of the deed that can cause it to ripen in the same life are one, deeds committed towards a powerful object, two, deeds committed with a very powerful or extraordinary motivation. The four features that make an object special are one, a higher form of life. For example, deeds committed towards a human being are more powerful than towards an animal, as the former has a greater chance of attaining enlightenment in this life. Two, beings in a state of serious suffering. Three, someone who has given you very special assistance. Four, someone who possesses high spiritual qualities or realization, as they have reached various unstained, unstained states, uh, totally involved with helping all living beings. Whether helping or harming such objects with these very special features, that will surely lead to a quick experience of an appropriate result. And I got cut out during the next paragraph last week. So um, I, I'll read the, the article out now, and then we will dissect it and utilize the three wisdom tools to, to develop the understanding or realize the understanding. The four types of consequence from a karmic action are, <clears throat> one, a ripened result. Refers to the type of rebirth a being will take. For example, for killing, depending on the intensity of the mental poisons, rebirth will occur in one of the states of suffering, in the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, or the animal realm. Two, a corresponding experience result. Even if born human, you tend to get hurt in the same way you hurt others. For example, for killing, life is short and you get sick easily. Three, a corresponding habit result. You tend to enjoy the same sort of deeds in the next life, such as having an attraction to killing, even as a child, for instance. Four, environmental result. Your deeds also affect the kind of world you later live in. For instance, consequences expressed in the outer world for killing are that food, crops and medicines are inferior, with little nutrition or potency, and cause disease even as well as many beings around you dying early. The six conditions for deeds to be done and collected are, one, the deed must be done intentionally. That is, the action is premeditated. It is not done on the spur of the moment or accidentally. Two, the deed must be done to its completion. It must be planned, carried out and completed. The person who committed the deed feels no regret later. Number four, there must be no counteraction to work against the force of the deed, that is, without the purification of confession, regret, future restraint, and other antidotes. Five, the deed must be done with the necessary attendance. <clears throat> these are any deed, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the, any deed, the, these are any deed in which you rejoice having committed, done with preliminary motivation and taken to its final conclusion. Six, the deed is of type certain to ripen. That is, done with strong emotion, done repeatedly, and done towards a holy object, parents or teachers. We must purify past negative deeds, restrain ourselves from collecting new bad deeds. We must protect and strengthen the positive deeds we have collected already, not allowing them to degenerate, as well as gathering new positive imprints. So that's the end of the article. I think maybe we still have quite a bit of time to go, which is good. Excuse me. <clears throat> With this last, I think it's been maybe the last month, it's been really bad winds down here throughout the, uh, I think, the eastern part of and southern part of Australia, actually. Very extreme weather. Um, okay, so let's once again now use the wisdom of hearing. And um, before I do that, I will drink. Water. So, just hearing the teaching now, the four types of consequences from a karmic action are, so listening to this one, one, a ripened result. These are the titles or subtitles of the types of consequences resulting from the karma, the karmic action. A ripened result refers to the type of rebirth a being will take. For example, for killing, depending on the intensity of the mental afflictions, rebirth will occur in one of the states of suffering, the hell realm, hungry ghost realm, or animal realm. And of course, it's likewise appropriate result will happen um, if you are engaging virtuous actions. You know, heavenly rebirth or birth as a human being with good conditions and so on. Okay. And of course, this on the way to becoming enlightened you know, helps to cause that. So, so the merit, the merit balanced with the wisdom or sort of um, accompanied by the wisdom, you could say. The wisdom, of course, is essential. The merit includes compassion and love and kindness and so on. Okay. So now you can absorb your mind with this. Teaching, contemplating the ripened result type of karma you create causes your rebirth. Type of rebirth. Then number two, so hearing again, a corresponding experience result. So the name of this type of consequence is the corresponding experience. So even if you are born as a human being, you tend to get hurt in the same way you hurt others. For example, for killing, life is short and you get sick easily. And once again, I'm pointing out some negatives here in this, in this paragraph, but it applies as well to the positive, the wholesome. If you have engaged in good actions, then let's say you were born as a human being and not in the heavenly realms. You still you have good conditions in, in that life. So absorbing your mind with that just for 10 seconds, because I think it, we went through it a little bit last week. Okay. Number three is a corresponding habit result. You tend to enjoy the same sort of deeds in the next life such as having an attraction to killing as a child, for instance. Or if your habit is engaging in generosity, then in the next life, you are generous. You continue the habit. So obviously, we should continue the wholesome habit, relinquish the unwholesome if we have it then, you know. Number four, the environmental result. Your deeds also affect the kind of world you later live in. For instance, consequences expressed in the outer world for killing are that food, crops, medicines are inferior with little nutrition or potency and cause disease, as well as many beings around you dying early. So if you engage in this act of killing, then you're creating killing around you. 
even if it doesn't directly happen to you. You tend to be, your mind tends to be focusing on these negativities because you've caused these negativities. But once again, if you, you have been positive, if you have been wholesome, virtuous, then you will have the virtuous things and the good things happening around you. You know, let's say you've been generous and so on. Then, of course, using these the examples here, then you will have abundant amount of food, crops, medicines, all good, all able to benefit you and help you, all um, superior, lots of nutrition, potency, you know, you tend to be quite well and people around you are, you know, healthy and so forth. So we're kind of doing the um, the hearing or just did the hearing, contemplation and um, absorbing the mind all together in, in a sense really for that paragraph. Part of, part of the reason for that was because we, we did it a little bit last week. So now the, con the six conditions are so hearing. Six conditions for deeds to be done and collected are, one, a deed must be done intentionally. That is, the action is premeditated. It is not done on the spur of the moment or, or accidentally. Number two, the deed must be done to its completion, planned, carried out, and completed. So contemplate that just for a moment, for a short time, and then absorb your mind with that. Hearing again. Three, the person who committed the deed feels no regret later. So let's say that this person has engaged in negative actions, followed through with the, the actions, the initial action being the thought, the planning in the mind, then carried, carried it out physically and verbally um, and has no regret later. Also, you can apply it the opposite way as well. Let's say you've engaged in good actions then you don't have uh, regret of doing these good actions. That's actually a good thing. Because we can do that because we're selfish beings still, you know. You do something good, you regret it later. I give away your nice jacket. Oh, I wish I still had that jacket. I wish I didn't give it away. Simple example that I've used before. Okay? We'll leave that there. And so um, now we can uh, go to number four. There must be no counteraction to work against the force of the deed. That is, without purification of confession, regret, future restraint, and other antidotes, which I kind of alluded to just then. The deed must be done with the necessary attendance that, are, that are, these are, I should say, any deed in which you rejoice having committed, done with preliminary motivation and taken to its final conclusion. The deed is of a certain type to ripen. That is done with strong emotion, done repeatedly towards a holy object or parents or teachers. So now you can contemplate that. If we do get cut off, because um, that will happen soon, I think, then I rejoice in your goodness, meritorious goodness always. I look forward to, to seeing you next week, to starting the new subject of the contem contemplation on the unsatisfactory nature of cyclic existence. So contemplating these teachings, I finished the last little paragraph. We must purify past negative deeds and restrain ourselves from collecting new bad deeds. We must protect and strengthen the positive deeds we have collected already, not allowing them to degenerate, as well as gathering new positive seeds. What to pick up, what to increase, what to put down, decrease, so forth. So con 